Hello and welcome to a Building Smart webinar titled BSI and OGC Roadmap. Thank you for joining. My name is Ra Twilley and I will be your moderator today. Mark Goldman will also be moderating this session. He is the Director of Architecture, Engineering and Construction Industry Solutions at ESRI and he will be introducing the speakers and the session. The webinar is scheduled to last one hour with a short Q&A at the end. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available for replay on our website and we'll send a link in an email after the event as well. I would like to remind you that your phone lines will remain muted for the duration of this webinar. If you have any questions or wish to make comments, please use the chat function located within the control panel. I would also like to bring to your attention that Building Smart is committed to ensuring that participation in the development of standards is unrestricted and the process for their adoption is transparent and standards that are developed do not favour any particular provider and are open, non-binding and accessible to all. Please take note of our antitrust code of conduct. Now I'll hand over to Mark. Thank you, Ra. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, where we intend to bring you an update on the progress that's being made on the work between Building Smart International and the Open Geospatial Consortium, the roadmap that is being developed, and a uh, small number of activities that are taking place while the roadmap is itself being, um, being progressed on. Uh, I'll let everyone give a brief introduction at their portion of the, the webinar itself. We'll also do some quick polls throughout the webinar to gauge levels of interest and areas of, uh, of importance on the topics that we'll be talking about today. So we'll start with a bit of a background. Uh, perhaps that's what I'm already doing right now. Uh, then I'll hand it over to Jag, who will specifically be talking about the initiatives, the roadmap development, the progress that's been made on it. Uh, Abhishek will talk in more details about the activities, the timeline, uh, the way in which the roadmap is coming together in a, a structured manner. And then, as said, we'll show three activities uh, proving that there is actually progress being made in a, a rather agile manner, again, as the, the roadmap itself is being developed. We're not waiting for full completion. We're making uh, progress along the way. Uh, short discussion on next steps and then Q&A. And as Ra mentioned, encourage you to use the Q&A panel from the, uh, the chat for the Zoom to send your questions our way and we'll try to get to those at the end. So with that, Jag. Well, thank you, uh, Mark. It's really exciting to be able to present this uh, roadmap to you as a team. We've been working on it for quite a while and, and uh, I think it is coming together as Mark said. Uh, my name is Jag Malela, I'm with WSP and I had the pleasure of leading 20 or so professionals who are steeped in the history and tradition of making BIM and GIS come together uh, to make sure that the data that is uh, captured in the applications within these domains is continuous and serves uh, the greater purpose of actually making uh, decisions using uh, the data as a basis. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do, let me see if the controls work, Mark. Um, it seems like you may have to advance it for me if you don't mind. Um, so to the next slide, um, the what is the context setting in which this roadmap was developed? Uh, I think that's the first thing to tackle here. I mean, there is uh, there is no question that there is increased demand for information uh, across life cycles that actually demands and places a demand on uh, the data cycles you know, and the data um, platforms across life cycles. So, uh, and the continuity of that information across life cycles is becoming more and more important. Um, you know, we have always talked about applications and interoperability between applications. Um, you know, it's been a growing um, drumbeat, you know, over, over time, but also across scales, you know, not all applications are created for everything. You know, some capture large geography information and territory information like GIS and some capture more detailed buildings information. So even among structured data, you know, you do have a need to drive that information continuity across uh, scales uh, because all of that is relevant in decision processes for various purposes. Um, there is also, you know, uh, 
in in today's uh, world a, a cro increased cross domain uh, data use for example you think of smart cities smart buildings uh, sustainability um, decarbonization goals uh, you can clearly see that there is um, a demand for for cross domain data use uh, which again drives the need for data interoperability and hopefully standards based uh, data interoperability and there is a heightened emphasis to preserve data life cycles as a result of all of this. Uh, but more importantly, also simultaneously, as we are thinking about the, the problem of uh, information modeling and continuity, there is uh, giant stri strides made in the industry today on in tools and technology. You know, we have uh, already partnerships, you know, in place between the BIM and GIS application developers on fungibility of data uh, across the domains. There is uh, certainly the evolution of cloud and cloud technology and um, has, has really helped in collaborations uh, across uh, various data domains. So I think we should capitalize on that. So that's another context imperative in the sense that technology has advanced for us to make all of these, this possible today. And last but not the least, the development of open st data standards uh, has really changed the game. You know, where we used to do peer-to-peer -peer or business-to-business -business connections of, of data and integrations. Today, if that's based on open standards, that really, really changes the game. And the work that Building Smart International and OGC have done, you know, um, uh, over the years really lends itself, you know, to um, uh, to this information modeling continuity. So that's, that's a key context imperative as well. Next slide, Mark. So, so BIM and GIS integration efforts are certainly not new uh, within the Building Smart International and OGC communities. You know, this has been an emphasis area for well over a decade. There have been several global movements to bring these data domains together, as many of us know. Uh, I just did a quick snapshot here you know, of, of where the integration concepts you know, first started trying to trace back the origins of it, and certainly, you know, uh, you know, I, I could put my finger on specific things that have happened, uh, like the BIM GIS integration uh, concepts in, emerged in the early 2000s. By mid 2000s, I think the focus on uh, data interoperability standards actually, and the standards development process actually put more focus on BIM GIS data connections. In, in prior to that, it was more uh, transformations of data, but the interoperability standards really helped connect the data uh, com completely taking into consideration that you know the real world is represented using multiple uh, in multiple ways you know there are multiple representations of the real world so the best way to connect it is is, is to through the user interoperability standards you know IFC and city GML in that sense you know from building smart and OGC respectively played very key roles in trying to bring that data together in the late 2000s and in 2010s you know the software industry, actually adopted some of these standards and started developing tools actually to bring the data together. That really spurred uh, some of the growth and momentum. And as I mentioned earlier, cloud technology improved the collaborations, linked data principles, where you uh, link data using different data from different data models, you know, wherever they might exist. You know, linked data is becoming very co uh, common today to link um, information across uh, various data domains. In mid-2010s, you know, that started to take shape. And in late 2010s, you know, uh, now we see the public agencies or, uh, or the stakeholders drive uh, GeoBIM integrations. And, and uh, we are seeing more of that now. There is demand to actually create specific, um, specific uh, data sets that, that serve public uh, use and, uh, of, of the integrated data sets. Uh, so all of that has steadily built up uh, uh, momentum. So even though these efforts are not new, we have a renewed vigor and momentum to carry this forward. So what's new and what's next? If you click on the on the button there, Mark, for me once, what's new you know, now is that I think there is significant shift in momentum to create integrated requirements. In, in the past, we talked about requirements for a specific phase of the life cycle. Now we want to create requirements that cross life cycle phases where these data domains need to come together. So you'll start seeing requirements you know that are that are both BIM and GIS based you know it's integrated uh, together uh, we have better data modeling and integration uh, we are talking about modularity of data we're talking about you know data models being uh, being not very very large data models but actually compartmentalized in a way that we can actually 
connect to the piece that we want to. Uh, we have better techniques for connecting data, like as I mentioned, linked data. We have better understanding from uh, uh, our stakeholder organizations, whether they are infrastructure owners or policy makers on, on, uh, on how BIM GIS and GIS can come together. And certainly we have better tools than we ever had before. Think about the RESTful services and APIs uh, that exists where we can actually easily make all of this possible on using the cloud technology. So there is a lot happening. So I think that's the momentum in, uh, in, in, that we can seize. And that's the momentum certainly that was behind us as we thought about creating this uh, geometry roadmap. Next slide. So the roadmap, roadmap development, therefore, you know, was based in this context. And uh, click on the next slide, Mark, please. So, um, so the objective really was to capitalize on 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 that momentum. But I think one thing the the development team recognized is that, you know, the connections between BIM and GIS are certainly user. Uh, driven in the sense that use case driven, you know, um, even if it is standard space, the requirements are so specific to the business domain and the problem you're trying to solve as you're integrating these data sets uh, that, you know, we wanted to center the roadmap uh, as being a user driven roadmap where we are solving real world problems um, and also tackling uh, the data connection not at the very high level in terms of semantics but you know semantics are certainly good standards are good but we want to focus them uh, narrowly to solve the use cases of interest and when i say use cases we we we, we will talk about that a little bit more an aggregation of a general problem but 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 it is certainly a use uh, that needs to be solved because you know there is so much nuance in the bim gis data integration world that i think make trying to make it general uh, you know, we'll probably spin our wheels forever, but solving real problems will will create interest and actually get software toolkits out, you know, much faster. So that was one of the big things. So basically to leverage that momentum and develop a user-driven roadmap of sustainable actions to guide consistent and seamless use of open standards to enable better information management across the infrastructure lifecycle domains is the central objective, but I don't, don't want to lose the term user-driven there, so. So that was that was a clear goal for us. So everything was user centric and user driven. At least the roadmaps actions you will see later on uh, are based on that. Next slide, Mom. Uh, the committee. I have to uh, mention this. We had about twenty odd people in and out over the last couple of years or so, trying to help you know um, uh, develop this roadmap. Many of them steeped in in the BIM GIS world for a very long time, a majority of their careers. You know, and some of their names are here. Um, and I really appreciated everyone that participated, took the time. We we met at a pretty uh, regular cadence every two weeks or so for about a year, and then we kind of tapered off towards the end. But really appreciate um, all the support and effort. And what you can see in this makeup is, you know, we have consulting community, we have data modeling modelers and data scientists, we have client owners taking interest, we have software tool developers. We have standards organizations and leadership from Building Smart and OGC actively participate in this discussion. And so it really helped us um, uh, a lot in the roadmap development. So, so kudos to all those people um, that, that supported this effort. Next slide. And some of them are on the, on the panel today. So you'll hear from them directly. Um, in terms of the objectives for the roadmap, again, as I said, we were user-centric and very use case focused. So the first thing, the very first objective is to actually start um, identifying and solving the low hanging fruit essential use cases uh, that benefit from uh, the continuity in data modeling. And that was a very key goal for us because we do want to solve real problems. The roadmap otherwise will not be actionable and probably will become a document on the shelf. So I think we do want the roadmap to sustain itself. And the best way to sustain it is to center it on uh, real world uh, use cases and solving problems. That way we can demonstrate the benefits of, of how open standards can be used uh, to achieve the goals of the roadmap, get a heightened attention from the industry uh, stakeholders, um, and, and hopefully uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll be able to reissue a call for pilots you know, once we get, once we clearly demonstrate the benefits you know, of, of uh, 
developing BIM and GIS together for solving specific problems, you know, we'll be able to get more stakeholder attention. And that's the best way to actually, you know, start uh, increasing awareness around why BIM and GIS requirements should be developed together and how we can develop a harmonized and consistent approach across the industry. In today's world, I mean, I just want to emphasize that, you know, I do uh, meet with BIM professionals and I do meet with GIS professionals, as, as many of you would recognize, they are generally in two separate worlds. Those worlds are now coming together, even at stakeholder organizations. You know, they're finding each other and this roadmap is, is going to provide a, a fuel for that and hopefully develop a longer term uh, solution to the challenges. You know, there are certainly challenges um, in, in the data models and the scale um, uh, and at stakeholder organizations, but hopefully the roadmaps actions you know, by creating this early momentum will help us you know, unearth those challenges and leverage those opportunities for data to come together. Next slide. So uh, as we develop this roadmap, you know, we recognize some of the challenges that need to be tackled by the roadmap and we put them into three buckets. Uh, certainly those challenges become opportunities if you actually uh, create the roadmap actions in a way that you know leverage our strengths and kind of to kind of suppress the weaknesses, if you will. Uh, the three buckets we put in, certainly in the adoption side, you know, from implementation stakeholder organizations, there are buckets of challenges and opportunities. Uh, there is one bucket of challenges and opportunities. The second bucket is around data management. Traditionally, when BIM and GIS were brought together, I think we spent a lot of time in this world of modeling data, integrating data, transforming data, and making use of it. Uh, but I think... Uh, Certainly that needs to be done, but that is not the only thing that needs to be done. I think adoption and creating use case based solutions, you know, will drive, you know, um, better data modeling and better awareness around, you know, what we should be do to model data and, and integrate. Uh, and the last one certainly is the availability of tools and technology. Um, there is both opportunity and challenge there. And if you click the next slide, you will see some of those. I won't dwell on all of these things that we unearthed, but these are samples of, of uh, challenges and opportunities that the team went through. And the roadmaps actions essentially are, are aimed at, at taking, um, uh, taking some of those challenges and converting them into roadmap activities uh, to be solved. Next slide. So, so considering that this roadmap is based on user-driven and user-centric and use cases in different business domains, I think one of the things we did was, what are those essential use cases as samples that we need to solve? You know, we looked at, uh, you know, uh, creating use cases by business domain. And you'll see some of those domains here, aviation, buildings, highways, rails, waterways. Certainly we considered other domains and there, there are more to be added. This roadmap is a living document you know, more domains come in like environment, environmental uh, uses, uh, smart districts, smart cities, you know, uh, things of that nature, uh, which are cross domain uses and more can be added. Uh, but within each of these domains, as you'll see on the next slide, you know, what we did was we started creating, at least mapping out some of the stories, user stories, you know, what an actor, why would anybody want to connect BIM and GIS, let's say within a certain domain. So in the buildings world, for example, you see a, a number of stories that are populated here. Our goal in the roadmap is to continue to populate such user stories that bring that need BIM and GIS data requirements to be um, brought together and data modeling to happen. So, for example, in the case of buildings, we have a few user stories here. For example, um, it says create digital as built digital twin for a building. You know, that's the user story. And there is a description for that story. And the epic, you know, where that story fits in is in, let's say, an emergency response. So that, that's a specific use case for why a digital twin is needed in building. Certainly, that's not the only one, but it is in planning. You could have a digital twin for a different reason. We do want to surface in these kinds of stories, you know, hopefully closer to the ground. You know, people in buildings, let's say, working in standards committees can come up with these stories. And then that bubbles up into something that's a common problem to be solved and from there, we launch the roadmap activities in terms of data modeling and uh, software application development. Uh, I think the next slide has a similar set of stories for the highways world. Again, the user story, just to pick one, is uh, update asset inventory using a digital as-built. 
Now the, the story is described there is an asset manager would want to get digital as built model right after construction. The epic there, the specific life cycle phase is the handover phase, you know, when construction is complete and you're moving into asset management. So again, you know, these are the stories in the back of our mind uh, that we had as we developed the roadmap actions and certainly propagating them through the roadmap activities is one of the big um, ideas we have in, in terms of the early uh, work uh, that is required to be done here. Next slide. So with this in mind, you know, uh, I'll turn this over to Abhishek Bhargava, who um, who will take us through a uh, roadmap, the roadmap specific activities and and the sequencing of the work um, that we had in mind. So Abhishek, please take it over. If I can, before that, um, maybe just get a feel for who is on the webinar here. Um, we've got a good number of people. It'll be interesting to see, you know, from what kind of industry you 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 come from. So hopefully you're seeing my screen still, and it's a Mentimeter presentation. If you all can take maybe just you know 30 seconds here, go to menti.com and type in this code. We're going to ask a couple of questions, or if you've got your phone out, hit the QR code, and it will take you right to this mentee um, survey with just a couple of questions. So I'll uh, hopefully see you joining in just a second here. Hopefully you're seeing my screen with the QR code. Yes, I can. Mark. Great. All right. I see a few people already joining. That's wonderful. Okay. So um, I'll just leave this here for a second so that everyone gets a chance to join. Looks like we got up to about a dozen or so folks already. Very good. I'm going to ask just a real simple question that hopefully applies to everyone. And while my screen is shared here, you can still see at the top dementi.com with the code to answer. Just, you know, what organization, what kind of organization are you with? Kind of bunch together architecture and engineering because those two tend to often intersect construction. Are you a software developer, a standards organization, perhaps with academia, um, owner operator, client owner? Would be interesting to see if we've got any folks there. Someone says they are others. So not surprised. I figured I couldn't have covered every category. So just let us know so that when we do get to the, the Q&A and as the presentations are being given on on the activities that are taking place, you know, we, we are making sure that we're talking to the right uh, type of folks. And this is a pretty good sample already. So a bit about yourself. Thank you for taking the moment or two to let us know who you are. It looks like a pretty even split between AE firms, software developers, and standards organizations. And if we extrapolate this across the full audience, we'll know that we got a good spread here. And then just uh, sort of an, an open question here. You know, already JAG has done a really great job of describing a number of BIM and GIS connection uh, values, opportunities, use cases. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled that uh, that we're actually getting this progress around use cases. That this is very much user-driven, use case-driven. So would love to see what you think are the challenges that are worthy of being addressed. Just a you know simple statement. You should just be able to type it out on your phone or on your keyboard. Let us let us know. And you know these are the kinds of things that are helping drive the uses, prioritizing the progress, um, understanding where to to put our focus. So I'll just keep this this running for a little bit here, and I will move that off screen and let. Uh, let Jag start again with um, presentations. Let me bring that screen back up. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. Over. Thank you. Uh, so next, we are going to look at the set of roadmap activities that we developed, the timeline for them, and the process of execution of these activities. So on the next slide, we're gonna basically first show you how we grouped these activities to address the challenges that JAG outlined uh, in the previous section. To once again, recall the challenges that he outlined, we divided the, the challenges into three buckets. The first set of challenges was associated with the adoption of open standards at 
standard develop at owner agencies or client agencies. We call them stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders who are involved in digital delivery process, stakeholders who are basically from the construction industry that are contractors, that are owner of client agencies who are creating the jobs or asset managers or software developers. Everybody who is involved in a data exchange is considered a stakeholder. And understanding the needs and the requirements of these stakeholders um, to address the problem associated with adoption of open standards was the first set of activities that we identified. We said that if we have to uh, have these people adopt these open standards, these BIM and GIS standards, and utilize them in their processes, we really need to understand their requirements, their use cases, their business needs, their data that they're actually creating as part of those use cases. Um, and, and how do they exchange what data? Uh, um, all of that needs and requirements has to be assessed. And therefore there is a set of activities, we group them under group one, G1, um, and call them as, as one set of activities. Once we have that understanding, we can really start looking at those data models, those data requirements, those use cases as standard development organizations. Both OGC and BSI have already have working groups and they're working on standards, but we wanna understand what is it that the clients need? What is it that our stakeholders need in terms of standardizing the data? And, and that information coming from the group one set of activities can be goldmine for standard development organizations in terms of not just the use cases, but also the data that is associated with those use cases. What specific objects, what specific infrastructure elements, what specific properties, what specific relationships between the data assets is, some, uh, is, is, uh, is, is part of the need that has been defined by the stakeholders. So this creating those working groups and giving them this information that was collected as part of G1 set of activities is, uh, is what we identified as the next set of activities and we group them under G2. So now we have the data, we have the needs and the requirements, we have the appropriate working groups identified in OGC and BSI. We know which working group, what data elements, what standards need, uh, need to be brought to the table. We are now ready for actually developing those data standards. We are basically ready to say, yes, OGC has a library of standards, but something like an infra GML or a city GML could be used for the infrastructure, highway infrastructure domain, and something else could be used for the building infrastructure domain and something else could be used for the rail and the water and the port infrastructure domain. Um, so identifying, uh, the, using those working groups, we basically identify what specific standards exist today and what standards have to be developed and which standards have to be integrated, both not, uh, across B BSI and OGC. Um, so that's basically set three of activities, which is under group three, um, developing a set of toolkit. When we say toolkit, one is the schema of the standards, the object types, the properties, uh, the relationships. The second is APIs to publish information about those standards so that so software developers can utilize those APIs to adopt those standards. Even client and owner agencies and other stakeholders in the uh, across the board can start to see what are the standards and how to incorporate them. So those are the toolkits that we are thinking about would be developed as part of the group three set of activities. Once those uh, uh, standards have been developed, and the specific standards that need to be utilized to solve each use case associated with BIM GIS integration have been brought to the fore. We are now ready to basically coordinate with software vendors so that they can adopt these standards and provide support for these standards um, within their software itself. Um, this is to basically ensure that the stakeholders who are utilizing these software also have the ability to adopt those standards using the softwares that they're already utilizing. This is a way of actually reaching out to the um, to the stakeholders in that case. And so coordination with the software vendors was identified as this uh, another set of activities. And in this, we basically talk about formal agreements with software vendors, engaging them to uh, align the proprietary standards with the open standards, ensuring support in a consistent manner across different uh, softwares. Uh, those are all the kind of things that we would basically do under that set of and group of activities. And finally, now that we have 
provided that support and build that support in the software. We have built those standards and the toolkits. We are ready to do some training for the agencies coming the whole circle, which is essentially letting the agency see how to use those standards in the software systems that have been created for them, um, how to actually bring on their resources to operate the creation of data models in a more interoperable, in a more standardized manner. Um, so that basically brings us from the owner agency requirements all the way back to training them on the developed toolkits on the open standards for BIM and GIS. So with these five groups of activities, the next set of uh, the next slide is going to show this specific list of all the activities that fell under each of the groups. And G1, G2, G3, G4, and G5 here show the bands of these activities. Uh, I'm not going to go through the, uh, and read all of these activities, but one thing I want to quickly highlight is, um, number one, the activities that you see in yellow are essentially the activities that are addressing the challenges associated with adoption of BIM GIS standards at the owner agencies. So when you start with identifying the use cases in activity A1, and when you actually go back to the owner agencies and you start talking about uh, the training programs that they need to deploy and the governance guidelines they need to have for adoption of those data modeling standards in activity A5, we are basically addressing the needs of the stakeholders that are engaged with the client and owner agencies, including the contractors and the software vendors who are actually engaged in the digital delivery process. Uh, the second set of activities, which is uh, shown in blue, is essentially the standard development activities. And these are this, this, these are the activities where the BSI and OGC working groups are coming together and they are starting to build those toolkits, uh, those data model, um, those object type libraries, those properties, um, those relationships, and those APIs for dissemination of the standards. Um, and finally, the green activities are essentially the activities that are associated with incorporating those standards into the software platforms so that the uh, agencies and the stakeholders can adopt those standards. One other thing I would like to highlight on this slide is all of these activities are happening parallelly um, uh, as opposed to in a waterfall in a sequential manner. And that's quite important. Um, the, the group felt that we need to act, collect information from the owner agencies and the stakeholders about their needs, about the data and the models and the use cases they have. And at the same time, we need to go and start having discussions with the working groups at OGC and PSI to say, okay, these are the data sets that we are seeing. These are the user requirements we are seeing. What standards can be best leveraged here? We then at the same time look at software and see which of these standards have already been incorporated in the software, whether it is an IFC or whether it's an infra GML or a city GML or something else. We need to basically start looking at the software support as it exists today and what are the needs that are uh, in terms of further improvement there. And we also need to start looking at what are the owner agencies and stakeholders already utilizing in terms of the training that they're providing on the standards. And then we basically come back and iterate through this process to say, okay, let's grow these standards a little bit more. Let's grow the, the support in the software a little bit more. It's not like we are starting from scratch is one of the key things. And that was the point Jack highlighted at the beginning of this presentation, that there's already a lot of momentum across all of these activities. And we want to kind of continue to build on these in an iterated manner so that every six months, every year, we are actually making some new progress and achieving some new milestones. So parallelly executing these activities was one of the key things that was discussed uh, uh, and, uh, and was quite important, the group fed. So the final slide I'll show here with respect to the execution of these activities is how to execute them in a parallel manner. And this is where the agile approach comes in. So bringing everything together from everything that we have heard so far, we start with a backlog of all of those user stories that you saw in the first part of the presentation. And they are across domains for that matter. They are user stories from buildings, from highway infrastructure, from rail uh, industry and whatnot. And many of those may have requirements and use cases associated with, I wanna hand over asset information at the end of construction to operations and maintenance. And that might be a user story that is across domains for that matter. We identify all of those user stories, we take them over in, into and break, break them into bite-sized chunks and say, let's take a sprint of six months, let's take a sprint of probably four months, a quarter, or maybe an year, and let's see what is it that we're going to focus on in this, in this sprint. We're gonna focus on these five use cases that are associated with standardizing data 
from this process to this process in terms of data exchange that involve these stakeholders. It would involve these standards. This is the lowest hanging fruit, if you may. Um, and let's actually take that uh, bucket and take it through our piloting process, wherein we are going to the owner agencies in the planning phase. We are identifying their needs corresponding to those use cases. We are identifying the data sets they're using. We are working with the working groups at DOGC and BSI. So that's where the planning of G uh, activities start with G1 and G2 set of activities showing. And then we start the implementation phase where we are actually developing the standards, the toolkits. We are actually coordinating with software vendors to see the support that can be built in the software that already exists in the software for those standards. And then the subsequent training of the resources. In that process, we have to always engage those stakeholders, which are the contractors, the owner agencies, the software vendors, to ensure that we are getting feedback from them on a regular basis um, as we are executing those activities. And if there are changes to be made, then we actually do them during that sprint itself. The final result is a version of those BIM GIS data interoperability standards and toolkits that would be deployed and made available at the end of the sprint, let's say, again, that quarter or after six months or one year. And then after that adoption, we basically come back and see what do we do in the next sprint and in the next year, and then this go, uh, so on and so forth. In other words, an iterative approach that's very agile and that basically allows for a continuous feedback loop as we implement all of those activities. So that's the plan in terms of executing these activities to address those challenges uh, across the owner agency adoption, across the development of standards, and uh, in terms of the deployment of those standards. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Abhishek, that was a very clear explanation of where we're at with the roadmap, how it's well structured, the process of going from a backlog of user stories using an agile approach to make progress. And with that, uh, I'm going to, um, I believe, introduce, is it uh, Francesca? Just... Is this... Sorry? It yes. is Francesca. Francesca, thank you, with, with her picture on the screen, in fact. Um, as mentioned, there are three activities that we're going to talk about. Progress that's being made while the roadmap itself is being nailed down, while the user stories are getting more details on them, actually proving the point that uh, GIS and BIM is, uh, is possible and, again, making progress on it. So, Francesca, I don't know if you might want to control the screen or if you just want to tell me to advance the slides. Okay, thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's try if I can control the screen. So I am Francesca Noardo from the Open Geospatial Consortium, and I will introduce this use case about uh, a digital building permit on which I've been working for a couple of years. And uh, in particular, I will show you the uh, results and uh, in-progress work within the Czech project. Let's see if it works. Yes, it might work. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, just to introduce you the relevance of this use case and why the connection of BIM and GIS is important. I just show you this, which is uh, uh, coming from an MSc thesis, but uh, it's really it's very relevant because it introduces a regulation in the city of Rotterdam that um, states and uh, that uh, parking places to be uh, planned for the new building are based uh, from the distance from other tran public transport facilities or other public parking facilities in the city, in the entire city. And therefore, it's really important to have um, this connection with the whole city representation in a GIS um, and not only uh, of the buildings which are around the new construction. And this is one of the most uh, um, clear cases uh, where we could see that uh, this connection is really relevant. Uh, so this is all the information which is needed for uh, digitalizing building permits or in building permit in general. We need a lot of information about the new building and construction. We need the data about the context and the city, and then we need the regulations, of course. Uh, so we need to manage all this information together. We need to pick the relevant data from the relevant sources. And for this, we need, of course, interoperability, especially for being able to use 
different kinds of tools were relevant and for each applications within a, a digital building permit as needed. We are tackling this uh, challenge uh, at OGC within two horizon projects. Uh, one is Accord and uh, uh, the other is Czech. And today I will especially um, present Czech, even if of course both of them are, uh, uh, are dealing with this issue, with this challenge, um, because Czech has a specific part uh, focus on geo and beam. So this is shortly the structure of the project. So starting from regulations and needs of municipalities and going through data requirements and standardization, we are providing some tools to support the digitalization of building permit. And the um, geo and beam connection is a very relevant part of the whole methodology. Here you can see the activities that were in the roadmap mapped to the different parts of the project. So in, uh, um, in the project, we are addressing more than one group of activities and uh, oh, too much, sorry. And uh, um, providing some research and solutions for different um, voices, uh, items of the, of the roadmap. But especially, I would like to focus on the most technical part here today, which is related to the exchanges and conversions from GEO to BIM and from BIM to GEO. So for uh, um, this, uh, for both conversions, we are starting from the definition of data requirements, of course, by leveraging and using the, the standards from OGC and Building Smart both as uh, data models and also as technologies for uh, defining the uh, data requirements. So IDS in the case of ISC and uh, uh, the OGC Data Exchange Toolkit in the case of uh, CTGML and uh, uh, CTJSON and the other um, GIS related standards that will be used. And uh, uh, this is preliminary to the mapping and to the conversion. And it's an essential uh, essential step for data validation and supporting all the rest of the workflow. Here you can see several tools that are being developed. Uh, the working group is led by Peter Bonsma from RDF. And the data requirements and these conversions and transformations are being the core of the work um, of the work package. So you already can see some examples of viewers. Uh, and uh, software converting one format into the other, um, including by leveraging linked data, and uh, some tools that are instead uh, working on the geometrical transformation. And uh, uh, these are the ones that I would like to show you because I think that they are among the most interesting parts. For example, we are developing uh, especially at the TU Delft, they are developing the IST georeferencing tool, allowing to uh, support uh, um, designers and the BIM uh, manager to apply a correct georeferencing as suitable for uh, uh, GIS, so with the needed accuracy uh, through the IFC, um, the proper IFC entity, uh, which is IFC map conversion. Uh, we have okay, a couple of importers and uh, also here you can see this IFC envelope extractor which are um, which is transforming the geometry of the original beam into uh, a generalized version of the beam itself which is compliant with the needs of the 3D city model and uh, it's uh, one of the most important parts for allowing the use of this kind of information. So the, um, the geometrical information derived from the beam into a GIS, because this is the, the kind of geometry which is uh, needed by a GIS to, um, to produce reliable analysis and, uh, um, and to really exploit all the powerful of GIS tools. So this is one of the um, most challenging, but in my opinion, interesting outcomes so far from this project. And uh, yes, and you can follow the other results um, in, the, in the website. And I hope to have more to show you 
next times. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Um, it's great to see the, uh, the the range of of use cases that you're exploring, the various applications that uh, that we should hopefully see some great GIS and BIM integrations coming soon. Um, I'm going to introduce very briefly uh, Michel Reeves from Vianova. Uh, he and I work together on a couple of the Building Smart initiatives. I'll let you introduce yourself in much more detail, Michelle, and I believe that you have the screen control yourself. So with that, go ahead, Michelle. Thanks, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Michelle. I'm running a company called um, Villanova France. We, uh, we are based in Paris, but we we act um, uh, internationally uh, in the Middle East, Africa, and more recently in the US on uh, two projects for uh, Meta, Facebook, two major large data centers where we do beam, beam management on all these projects. Um, we've been facing uh, the opportunity of uh, linking or interconnecting um, BIM and GIS on all those projects. And um, the purpose of this quick presentation uh, will be to showcase uh, a particular uh, use case that relates to uh, that relates to um, uh, the subsoil uh, assessment, the subsoil conditions assessment, and how both uh, BIM and GIS need to share that information around uh, that one matter, in particular for uh, infrastructure projects, but that is true as well for any building uh, projects uh, when it comes to dealing with um, uh, deep foundations, for example, of course. Let me see if I can get hand of the your screen, Mark. If Let's not, see. I can just advance the slides if you'd like. Yeah, please, because I, it says I have the control, but I do not. <laughs> okay, very good. Right, so this one slide uh, depicts basically a typical situation whereby uh, you'd have um, uh, long-lasting uh, geospatial data residing into databases, these databases being either you know regional, national, or federal, for example, like cadastral, uh, information building permits management databases, geoscience or geosocial, geomarketing databases, and subsoil conditions. Uh, typically, these things would be long lasting data maintained by uh, authorities. And um, what BIM uh, actor uh, or user uh, would be willing to do is consume that data from those databases in, of course, in a neat manner, um, so that uh, the uh, designer, the uh, infrastructure designer can understand uh, the existing situation when it comes to land acquisition, when it comes to built environment or, or underground uh, risks or risks associated with the lack of knowledge of the underground situations. Um, uh, and things like, for example, the, um, uh, the footprint of a project or of an infrastructure project uh, the space it will basically uh, use or need. Uh, this would result from the infrastructure project design itself, leading to cut and fields uh, themselves, depending upon, of course, the design of the alignment of the project. So everything is in interconnected. And um, the idea is that whilst the BIM solution, uh, of course, generates its own uh, design data and generates its own as built, uh, model, it has a view to uh, export that information for a portion of it into, uh, into an asset management solution. But likewise, it has a uh, it has a, a need to provide back to GIS geospatial data that would describe the you know the acquired ground, the structures, of course, the interconnections connections that have been uh, created, and subsoil conditions, for example, that have been encountered or reinforced. So all that information has to go back to a GIS database so that it can serve for further development projects. So it becomes then the up-to-date reference source of truth uh, that any further uh, uh, infrastructure projects will then consume at, at its time. So th that loop is something that uh, 
we 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 see in every single uh, infrastructure project. But of course, that we believe can be uh, can be uh, uh, improved in a sense. And this is one of the uh, uh, purpose of this initiative that we've been uh, uh, undertaking um, uh, in coordination between uh, PSI and OGC. Uh, next slide, please. If you can mark. Right. So uh, where do we fit into the roadmap that was presented earlier on? Well, at different level, as a matter of fact, uh, because the idea there is to um, suggest uh, suggest uh, where uh, data uh, can be um, um, used coming from both worlds, uh, so to speak. Um, and, um, and likewise, where, where can the processes uh, can be can be improved moving forward. So we we fit in uh, into different of those activities that were presented to you earlier on. Mark, next please. Right. So the first thing we did, and again that was the coordination between OGC and and, and BSI. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I was um, uh, I, I am still I'm still uh, leading the, the initiative on behalf of BSI. Um, and the first thing we did was to assess how the subsoil conditions were um, described in the different uh, standards, uh, being OGC standards or, or, or BSI standards. And we found out that there were, you know, gaps um, and at different level. And we 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 decided that uh, having made that assessment of what was missing, that we were. Uh, to uh, uh, in common uh, re redefine basically those different concepts with leading to one a single uh, domain conceptual model for geotechnics of course with two implementations one on the ifc side the other one on the uh, ogc geoscience ml uh, mechanics next slide please um, so the, 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 we, we basically had a group to, to, to define this conceptual model, this uh, shared conceptual model, and we uh, invited as well other uh, uh, bodies that, that had been working on the different standards that exist today in order to make sure that we, uh, uh, we compile uh, um, a, a, a scope that was, that was uh, uh, large and detailed enough to cover all the expectations of the ones using those different formats. So, for example, AGS in the US, in the UK, sorry, is a format that has been used for a long time. Uh, DIGS in the US, likewise. And, and so uh, we looked at all that to, to, to basically refine this conceptual model. Next slide, please. Um, one of the key things we achieved, and uh, quite quickly, and that was a very, very uh, good thing, we, we uh, agreed upon on an international basis, on an international consensus, we, we agreed upon the way to um, arrange data or to, to uh, filter data, so to speak. So uh, observations, factual data, tests data, uh, laboratory tests data, everything was uh, agreed upon to be of a particular category we called uh, book A. Book B were basically models that were created from an interpretation from these factual data by a geotechnician, uh, and of course with his expertise, uh, leading to a, a 3D model that uh, encompasses uh, things like uh, the potential or the possible uh, conditions of the subsoil with the uncertainties that were associated to, the, to those different uh, configurations and conditions. And the, that there was book B and book C was to um, uh, encompass everything that was related to helping with the design uh, of the uh, forthcoming uh, infrastructure in a soil structure interaction context. Next slide, please. So uh, just to give you a sense of uh, what this was to, to, to be um, clarifying, mainly helping with exchanging information between the geotechnician and the civil engineers when they assess on one side the subsoil conditions and on the other side the type of support that they need to, uh, to, to, to conceive, to, uh, to design in order to address the situation 
that the 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 the, um, the 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 geotechnician has assessed for the subsoil in that particular area. So in that particular case, for example, the geotechnician comes with situations along the alignment of the project, and then in which in view of which the the geo the uh, civil engineer de decides upon uh, the the proper supporting method for the structure given again the pressure that the subsoil will will exercise on the on the structure itself, and likewise, vice versa. Next slide, please. So a way to exchange that information in a way that both the geotechnician and the civil engineer understand each other is through a what we call a voxel representation, which basically is a set of cells. As you can see here, you have a set of unitary cells, which, um, uh, which have a particular uh, set of information, uh, some of which could be, for example, the the, the percentage of this particular uh, subsoil category or the, the, the quality of this particular subsoil. So mixing up a set of information on one particular cell, and typically this helps uh, provide a way so that the uh, civil engineer can best design his alignment uh, uh, given, again, the different uh, uh, subsoil conditions that the project may encounter. Next slide, please. There, uh, moving forward, once we have done this, uh, once we have uh, agreed upon the conceptual model, as I said earlier, there are two you know, different ways to implement that, both on the IFC side and on the OGC side. The idea there is that uh, um, a, 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 a GIS system dealing with geospatial uh, subsoil information would then provide that information through things like web services, for example, and that the beam authoring tool would consume that information through this web service and through the uh, uh, the different uh, OGC uh, uh, APIs that that uh, uh, that are being extended to support that new extended um, uh, conceptual model. Next slide, please. Uh, this has been documented. So th that initiative on the OGC side uh, was, uh, I believe, uh, terminated by the end of um, last year, 2023. It's been documented. You can have access to all, to all that on the OGC uh, website. Next slide, please. And likewise, uh, the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering uh, has been in the loop too, and they have created a specific uh, working group so that they, they, um, they will uh, disseminate the information on how best can BIM and GIS uh, integrate, intersect when it comes to exchanging uh, subsoil conditions. Next slide, please. I think that was last, my, my last comment, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Great uh, information, great content. I know this is a topic that specifically some of my colleagues um, are involved with uh, tunnels and boring and the integration between GIS and BIM. So it's one that I'm keeping my finger on the pulse. It's great to see that much progress. We're running a little bit late. Thank you everyone for staying on. We started a little bit late. Uh, next, I'll just very briefly introduce Eric Poyer who is, amongst other things, uh, leads the Building Smart Canada effort involved with ISO and uh, a professor. So Eric, I'll let you take it away. I don't know if you have control of the mouse or if you want me to advance the slides, just let me know. Uh, all right, I requested it, but uh, I'll- Here we go. Uh, let you got you, it, okay. thank you. Um, So thank you for uh, including uh, us in this uh, presentation. Um, I'm here to talk about current activities at uh, ISO um, related to the uh, BMGIS uh, development work. Um, I am having an issue uh, moving my screen, so I'll hopefully I'll work. So just in terms of where do we situate the ISO, current work at ISO um, within the roadmap developed uh, by the team. Um, so. There's two two points, two places. Uh, first is around in, uh, increasing collaboration between SDOs. Um, I saw, of course, an international SDO and, and all its uh, partner organizations, member organizations around the world. 
and uh, specifically with um, the activity set that's around um, the standardization. Of course, OGC, BSI develop a lot of technical standards. ISO, we're looking at product, process, management standards, um, so that underlie sort of the mechanisms and the, the, the practices that can uh, enable and make, uh, make all of this work uh, from a uh, organizational and a project uh, level. So just a little uh, context around uh, standardization work. Uh, so we have Building Smart International and the Open Geospatial Consortium who work, are working, of course, together and leading this effort. Um, just there's a couple of groups uh, that are working on standardization of uh, the built environment uh, and the national environment, but uh, around uh, specifically uh, organization of information and uh, management of information. So ISO TC59, SC13, which is around BIM, and ISO TC211, which is around GIS. And of course, you see liaisons and tight couplings between all these organizations. Um, so the work I'm uh, uh, discussing today is the work being done by Joint Working Group 14, which is a joint working group between ISO TC59, SC13, and ISO TC211. Um, so uh, there's a the the the, um, the joint working group uh, was born a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, the first activity was to publish a technical report on the state of BIMGIS interoperability and looking at what are the development aspects. So looking at it from a highly technical side um, and uh, looking at it from a uh, interoperability side. Um, of course, feeding off of the work that's been done at uh, BSI and OGC in the past. Uh, so it was this technical report 23262 was uh, published in 2021, uh, outlines the needs for to further interoperability between BIM and GIS on four levels uh, and across three barriers. So we used the ISO 11354 for, uh, enterprise interoperability framework, specifically look focusing on services and on data at the level at the inter, uh, interoperability level, uh, enterprise level and then barriers in terms, of, in terms of interoperability barriers, we're looking at conceptual and technological barriers. One of the things that this report does is looks at uh, specific incompatibilities between uh, BIM and GIS and what are these sort of things that have to um, be unpacked uh, to move forward. In addition, uh, there was uh, multiple opportunities for BIM GIS interoperability that were um, slated, so very aligned with the use cases. And this is where this the BIM BSI OGC approach is very uh, interesting, is around being uh, highly pragmatic and user driven. Uh, so uh, there's tight couplings there to have to be had, a lot of work to be had, uh, and synergies. Um, Within the report, three work items are proposed. So linking abstract concepts in BIM and GIS, uh, the ge geospatial and BIM review of vocabularies and information uh, guidelines between BIM and GIS. So these three packages or work items were born out of the opportunities and the challenges that were discussed. And what's interesting here is, of course, is working on the foundational aspects. So looking at terminology, looking at these these uh, these items of you know at different levels of abstractions, which will support uh, and feed into the roadmap to enable BIM GIS interoperability. Uh, if I look at the last work item, which is around information exchange guidelines, so here it's it's looking at formalizing and again laying the the, the foundation, laying the groundwork to enable this uh, and providing sort of reliable and robust standards so that uh, we can start developing uh, and building off uh, of this, this uh, developing these practices and these use cases. So if we look at the this particular work item was split into five packages, part one, which is uh, sort of the core principles and guidelines, uh, part two, which is facilitating data exchange through metadata, Part three around simplifying geometric representations, part four around semantic alignment of geo objects, and part five ensuring process quality. So all items that um, are uh, support and are uh, implicit in uh, enabling proper use cases. As of now, uh, when we look at uh, the current work, there's two uh, parts that are in, uh, being de uh, de developed. Uh, I'm leading one of the development, part one, uh, around the, the core principles and guidelines. And my colleague, Sang Ki Hong from Korea, 
is uh, working on the part two. Uh, of course, the joint working group 14 is a, is a collection of, of, of uh, standardization and specialists from around the world. Um, and uh, there's a group of about uh, 15 people working on this uh, from many uh, different uh, standards bodies around the world. So again, you know, if, th if this is work that interests you, there's the uh, BSI OGC, of course, uh, uh, use case devel uh, development work. And if, the, and if you're ever involved or want to get involved in the standardization work, you have to go through your standards, uh, country standards body to participate. And of course, there's a, a close liaison between th uh, this work that was being presented today and the work that's happening at ISO. Future work, looking at parts three and part four, again, are, are aligned in part five around uh, consistency and process quality. Don't, uh, so um, this is uh, the, the current status of work. Parts one and two are, are looking at uh, going to committee draft by the end of this year, beginning of next year, um, which means you know, we're looking at publication standards. Development takes some time. So we're looking at a you know, 18 to 24 month time frame to publish these standards. So this will have time to evolve. And of course, through close uh, uh, alignment with uh, the BSI OGC activities, we'll be able to inform and make sure that these standards uh, support and help move this agenda forward. So thank you, that's it. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next, I believe Jag gonna come back in and talk about yep. next steps. I think five minutes to wrap this up, but really a fascinating, really appreciate I know we went over, but I hope you found value not only in the roadmap uh, activities and how the roadmap is set up, but when we started this, I couldn't have imagined the alignment and that's happening on very large scale global efforts. Uh, you know, who can argue against a better way to model data for digital building permits to enable, you know, planning, city planning or better organization of data sets, you know, for of geotechnical data where all our infrastructure is is built on you know i think th these are very big efforts and those are efforts where bim and gis need to work together uh, it's it's again i think you may have seen the flavors of it is is it's very use case those are very large use cases but within those there are certain specifics that domains have to come and embrace like tunnels i think michelle talked about tunnels and uh, francesca talked about uh, about the digital building permits, but the amount of standardization that's already happening that we are tapping into as a roadmap, the amount of software implementation that's happening that aligns with the roadmap activities. And finally, Eric, you know, talking about the ISO activities and how that lines up with the roadmap is all just wonderful. I don't think we could have imagined it two years ago when we started this effort. So I think it's all coming together, I have to say. So there are next steps for this to build on this momentum. So. Uh, Mark, if you can click on the next slide, I just have one slide just to finish this off is, you know, we do have a plan. Number one, publish this roadmap, you know, in a very basic form. Uh, it's already available in the chat. Uh, I think, thank you, Ra, for posting that. Uh, this is available for public comment. Uh, we do hope to get all your comments, um, uh, you know, in the next 20 days or so. If you can download the document, go through it, tell us what you heard today, if that lines up with what you uh, thought, or if there are things that we should be looking at. We are very, very um, open to those comments. I gave you my email address uh, as my commitment to continue to chair this joint committee and take it to the next step. You know, once we have the comments, we do need to form a steering committee of all the interested standards organizations. And the only reason we said BSI and OGC is because they already have a community of users. Uh, they have a community of data suppliers and technologists as part of those communities. But anybody technically is, is welcome to come and join. You know, we will be liaising with uh, ISO through Eric's efforts and others uh, who are interested in this work. Uh, but we do need to form that steering committee membership to be driven by BSI and OGC. Uh, uh, you know, if you want to learn more about what's happening, I think we do have some work sessions planned in the upcoming meetings. If you click on this animation here, um, uh, Mark, one more time, there is an upcoming, uh, the, the download is available and also there are a couple of upcoming meetings. One more time, Mark, uh, there is a Valencia, the meeting of Building Smart International, there's an international summit in Valencia, Spain happening in March. So we will have some discussions around the roadmap, hopefully there. And then there is a GeoBIM 
for the Built Environment Conference uh, focused uh, conference by OGC, also happening late March in, at TU Delft. So uh, these are two uh, places where we will take this roadmap and and hopefully your comments and you know uh, and put them in front of committees and form the joint working uh, group to kickstart the activities of the roadmap. The goal is to reissue a call for pilots and we'll probably adopt some of these big use cases that are being developed globally, uh, but maybe find more um, common ground there and, and you know really issue that call for pilots and get uh, all the stakeholders that are uh, re related to those uh, use cases uh, in one place. And really the idea is not just to stay static on this roadmap is to drive that user uh, engagement and from requirements, BIM GIS integrated requirements, all the way through software toolkits that Abhishek mentioned, and uh, you know provide visibility to to the roadmap activity. So please come join us. You know if you're at these meetings, please uh, look one of us up. You know which is a part of this committee, and we'll be happy to provide more information. So thank you for for listening and apologies for that. We're running over, Mark. So. Yes, indeed. Um, I think it was a great, uh, a great session, great attendance. One last thing here: if you do want to reach out, um, you're interested in in learning more, interested in taking part. This is just a quick three or four uh, field form, name, email address. Uh, we collected about twenty names at the last Building Smart Summit, and I'll just keep this on screen as we wrap up here. We will definitely reach out to you to pull you into this very important effort. So, thank you, Jag, for for championing this and, and being the leader of this effort and Ibishek for your work in organizing things and certainly Michelle, Francesca and uh, and Eric for your your work today and your work behind the scenes. And thank you Building Smart and OGC. Thank you. Thank Great. you OGC and thanks for everyone to st for sticking around here. So I mean I don't know if there is time for a few questions Mark but uh, yeah, I mean, there really haven't been any that have come up on the um, on the Q and A. There, there was some really good. I'm going to maybe go back one slide here. The uh, topics that did come in, you know, very much resonate with what has been presented. Where I know this this effort is going towards, you know, this I, this one jumps out at me. Bidirectional interoperability between BIM and GIS is something that I'm trying to champion myself because I certainly understand that. GIS as a consumer of information is brilliant, but if it could also output back into BIM workflows, there'd be great value there. You'll see some very tactical and pragmatic ideas around um, simulation, construction simulation, 4D analysis, uh, creation of a common data environment that would be BIM and GIS. I like to think of this more about connected data environments than necessarily a common one is a term that I use, but these are this is great feedback on top of the use cases that are already being organized. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions come in and we are about 15 minutes over our allotted time, not, not surprised. So again, please do reach out to us. Please let us know if you're interested in, in learning more, taking part, and hopefully you'll be at Valencia or at Delft for either the Building Smart or the OGC meetings coming up. Quick thank you uh, on behalf of BSI as well. And just to say the recording will be uh, made available on the Building Smart International website and YouTube channel uh, shortly. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for all the presentations and thank you for the attendance today. And we'll bring this session to a close and hope to see you at the summit or a future event. Thank you everyone.